Hello, and welcome back. This is a continuation of my Scripted Schleswig Holstein Wars video that I made not too long ago. This video, though, that you're listening to now is going to be more relaxed, and I'm just going to address some extra details and context of the events around the Schleswig Wars, and more generally, 19th century Denmark and what is now Germany. So basically, this Schleswig Wars video became my most viewed video as of this moment. And there were just so many wonderful comments that I wanted to address. And instead of responding to people individually, I figured I would share with you all the extra historical context that was shared by viewers. Because there are some things here that will help you understand the narrative a bit better if you're interested. Now obviously, there was only so much I could fit into a 15 minute video. But I appreciate all the critiques and praises and questions everyone shared, and a lot of people shared information that I was somewhat familiar with, but did not include in the script, and then there was a lot that I had no clue about. And then there were some of you who live around the modern border, whether in Germany or Denmark, or have ancestors that actually participated in the wars, and you provided some great additional information that I would not normally have access to, so thank you. Now, the first and by far the largest critique of my original video was my awful, awe-inspiring pronunciation of a certain word. That word being Schleswig, which I am still struggling with. Yes, the most important word in the whole narrative and the word that the entire video was focused upon. So in that video I said something along the lines of Schleswig, and I had a lot of you tell me different ways to pronounce it, often contradictory. I think it's a word we struggle with if um, we haven't been exposed to it very often, in the English language at least. But I'm getting a hang of it, so thank you all for the critique. And then thank you for actually getting through that video if the way I pronounced that word really set you off. And I apologize, but hopefully my pronunciation is a little bit better now and that's something I'll have to pay more attention to in the future. So now let's get into some actual history and look through some of these comments that uh, raise interesting points, ask interesting questions, or bring to our attention some things that I did not even think about in the creation of that original video. So hopefully with the help of these commenters and uh, really you, the viewers, we can both, we can all learn something new. So, the first comment I want to talk about is by Julius Webb. He says, It is interesting how the Danes managed to hold on to their own identity and customs, despite having such a huge neighbor. And this neighbor has partially a close history, related ethnic origins, etc. It's much harder to stick to your own customs if the big guy next to you is related to you. And then Alexander Christopher responded. He says, Well, the thing is... The Danes' neighbor is a Germany that has not been unified for a long time. It was only in the 19th century when the context and boundaries of uh, what is now Germany is fully defined by the German nationalist movement. Meanwhile, the Danes were a regional power in Europe for during the same time of German disunity. It was one of the largest powers in Northern Europe. Only in the early 19th century did this nation get into bad situations like the Napoleonic Wars and the loss of Norway. So first of all, yeah, both of you have really good points. And uh, Julius, you raised a important question. How did the Danes hold on to their identity so strongly? Uh, we do view them as this tiny little minuscule power in Europe. In the 19th century, they were less than 1% of the European population. And yeah, that's probably... Uh, that's they're probably even a smaller percentage of Europe at the moment. And we can look at Germany's other small neighbors, such as uh, Netherlands and maybe Belgium, and ask how they retained their own identity. And that's sort of easier to answer because they had such strong, you know, th these countries in themselves were such strong economic powerhouses, whereas Denmark was not. And yeah, then Alexander brings up that, uh, yeah, of course, Germany wasn't really a thing yet. The German identity wasn't really fully complete yet, although there were parts of it that were. And yeah, Denmark was more powerful before the 19th century. They had Norway, and they held some diplomatic power. Back to the point of Julius now. 
I think we need to be careful not to overemphasize the Danish similarity with uh, Germany. Uh, but of course, if you look at the borderlands of any two or more territories, you see a lot of overlap, and a lot of times you see ethnic, cultural, architectural, and linguistic ambiguity. I mean, think of Alsace-Lorraine, or think of the borderlands of England and Scotland, especially in the Middle Ages. There's always going to be a lot of overlap, but more so in these territories. And then, of course, um, I'm not ignoring all the cultural exports that Germany gave to Den Denmark. Of course, this comes up many times in this video and my last video, that uh, German was really seen as the better language in Denmark. The nobility spoke it, and in the duchies in Schleswig and in Holstein, you know, uh, you, you were supposed to speak German in a lot of cases. So I think, you know, we need to give the Danes a lot of credit for holding on to their culture, but there are plenty of ways that they have become germ germatized, or however you want to say it. And I don't, I hope that doesn't um, come across as if I'm somehow diminishing uh, the Danishness of Denmark. I'm not. I'm just saying that German cultural exports, you know, really had a big effect on Denmark. But again, a lot of respect is due to the Danes for preserving their culture, both, both in the 19th century, uh, during the times of the Holy, Holy Roman Empire, and then even post-19th century. But at the same time, the Danes also benefited from being at the extremity of Europe, being at the fringes. In ancient times, they weren't subjected to anything like that of the Swaby under Rome. And uh, in the early Middle Ages, they weren't subjected to anything like the Saxons under Charlemagne, in which he converted them all. You know, we can think of Scandinavia in general. Um, we know they were some of the last people to be Christianized in Europe. And so it takes a little bit longer for these more continental ideas to reach Scandinavia. And then also there's the factor of Denmark's strategic importance, which it, um, there, there isn't much. So there is that um, it allows access into the Baltic. But other than that, there wasn't really a significant reason for, you know, Germany to want to take it or to want to assimilate these people too much to uh, a German culture. The Holy Roman Empire wasn't really putting a lot of resources into taking Denmark because there just wasn't really a huge reason to do so. So yeah, just to recap, the Danes were able to hold on to their culture to a large extent because their territory wasn't very important. Uh, you know, Germany never really did annex them until World War II because Germany didn't really want them. The Holy Roman Empire didn't really want them. They were on the extremity of Europe. And then the German-Danish connection is not really as strong as we may think. Of course, the languages have some similarity. They uh, come from the same people from uh, antiquity. But especially by the 19th century, these are two drastically different identities. Again, with a lot of overlap. Especially in the borderland region. And then back to the point of Alexander once again. Yeah, uh, the German identity wasn't defined yet. And for a long time, Denmark was a larger power in Northern Europe, especially in the Middle Ages and the early modern period. So instead of thinking of just Germany versus Denmark, you know, that Germany versus Denmark sort of makes us think that, oh my gosh, how did Denmark not become culturally assimilated? It's so tiny. But if we think of the German state versus Denmark, it sort of seems as if though Denmark was able to hold its own weight. I mean, even if you just think of size, which is not the most important measure, but if you look at size, at any point of German history or Holy Roman Empire history, Denmark, if it was a state, would be one of the largest states in the confederation. So, the next comment is by Tom. He says, I live in a small town right on the border between Schleswig and Holstein. 
Just a few blocks away from me, we have a Danish school, where children grow up learning Danish since kindergarten. And every summer on the town square, the flags flown from lampposts are Schleswig-Holstein in Denmark. Danish culture is still somewhat present here, not to mention up north in one of the region's biggest cities, Flensburg. 90% speak both German and Danish. I myself have spent at least a few weeks every year across the border in Denmark and decided to start learning Danish to embrace multiculturalism. Edit. I think we certainly have more in common with Denmark than we do with, say, for example, Bavaria. Fantastic. And I think, uh, you know, this just further demonstrates my point, even in modern times, that when we look at a giant unity like Germany or like the United States, uh, we should really look at it by its cultural regions. Because, like you said, Tom, if you live right next to Denmark, chances are you're going to identify more with some of Danish culture than some of uh, German culture, which is, I don't know, hundreds of miles away from you. But it is interesting to see how Schleswig-Holstein and uh, how it was divided really implicates uh, what's going on in the modern world. And I think it's fantastic that uh, Germany embraces its small Danish minority. And then best of luck in learning Danish, Tom. I've tried and learned some things, but ultimately it's too hard to speak for me. Obvious obviously, if uh, you watch the beginning of the video, you'll realize that pronunciation isn't my strongest asset. But I can read a lot of Danish at this point, and I find that you might have actually more trouble learning it than a native English speaker because I think Danish is more similar to English than German, but uh, maybe someone can correct me on that. Either way, Danish is very similar to both German and English. But seeing that you also know English, I don't see you having too much trouble. All right, next comment. This one is by Heino Bransma. They say, the German influence on the Danish language in the early 19th century is quite evident if you read the text. Spelling was more German-like, capitals and nouns, no A with the circle, but AA, also to be purposefully different from Swedish and lots of literally translated German words, especially in scientific and philosophical domains. To me, it felt more German than Danish sometimes. As a West Frisian from the Netherlands, I've been long interested in the North Frisian spoken in Schleswig-Holstein and Helgoland, which are very interesting varieties, all influenced to differing degrees by Danish, Jutlandic, Low German, and German at different times. And language history can tell us a lot about the history of the area. Absolutely, and I didn't know about any of this, but it really is telling, and I don't have too much to say about this, but I thank you for contributing. Uh, this just goes to show that, you know, German cultural exportation was uh, still prevalent in the 19th century, and it was actually quite influential. And that is interesting that, uh, as you say, this is the time that they started to use the double A instead of the A with a circle. And yeah, that was something I forgot to mention, or I didn't really, it wasn't really too relevant to mention in my other video that uh, North Frisian is spoken in Schleswig-Holstein and uh, it's a minority language. So thank you very much, Heno. And here we have another comment that talks about language. Lars Borsch says, True, they used to say the church spoke French slash Latin. The court and the nobles talked German, and you spoke Danish to your dog. This expression was probably from the conflict. And then Dazzy Dazu responded to this comment and said, I was told this as a kid. Being a German minority from Denmark, haven't heard it in a while, living in Copenhagen now. So, wow, this was very, uh, actually shocking to me that this was still a, a sort of stereotype about the Danish language, at least in, at least in small circles or in fringe areas, but very interesting. Thank you, Lars. All right, and now the next comment is by Tacitus1990. I was always curious just how the Danish government could be so reckless. The First Schleswig War happened when the German states were in appeal, but taking on Prussia and Austria at the same time, while their attention was undivided, was just suicidal. Now, this is very important because in my original video, I was somewhat speedy to 
explain the reasons for the Second Schleswig War. So let me try to rephrase what I said in the video while also adding some additional details. Ultimately, it was the November Constitution of 1863 that was signed by Christian IX. That was the primary justification for Bismarck to go to war with Denmark, because the November Constitution broke what was promised in the London Protocol of 1853 by bringing Schleswig closer to Denmark, which was not allowed. Now, the November Constitution did not incorporate Schleswig into the kingdom itself, but what it ultimately did was it created a new parliament which would govern the joint affairs of both Denmark and Schleswig. Both entities would still keep their own parliament, but a new parliament would be added as well over top both of them, that oversaw both of them. Now, it's possible that Christian IX may have thought he could get away with this, because as you see, it really is not incorporating Schleswig into this, uh, into Denmark, um, but it's, it's sort of unifying the two areas in a sneaky way. And if you remember, this was Christian IX's first act as king. He certainly felt pressure to sign the November Constitution. It was a risk he took to preserve the Hellstatt, and it was likely that Christian was worried about German interference in the duchies anyway. Um, at this time, of course, the the German rebels in the duchies were still quite prevalent. But yeah, on the other hand, I completely agree with you. Even though they were excited from the outcome of the first Schleswig War, I don't know how anyone thought the Danes could win this one. I think overall, Christian was just hoping that war wouldn't break out in the first place. And that uh, when the Prussians and Austrians did go to war at first, they were just bluffing. But of course, that was not the case. And the war caused, uh, as I said in the video, a humongous national trauma to the entire kingdom. Okay, so the next comment is by Some Opinion, and they say that one reason the king's proposal would never have gone through, there was already considerable animosity in Denmark between the Danish majority and the various German components of the state. And then he has a quote here from Wikipedia saying, Critics of Strunzi thought that he did not respect native Danish and Norwegian customs. He also did not speak Danish, conducting his business in German, to ensure obedience. He dismissed entire staffs of public departments without pensions or compensation, and substituted with nominees of his own. These new officials were in many cases inexperienced men who knew little or nothing of the country they were supposed to govern. And then he says, in short, he fired Danes and Norwegians in public office, replacing them with Germans. That didn't go down well, and ended badly. The fate of Stransi was incomprehensible to the general European audience, who didn't know of any separate Danish traditions worth preserving. Yes, and Stransi was a very interesting figure, although um, about a century before any of this happened. But for those of you who don't know, he was sort of the unofficial regent of Christian VII in the late 1700s. And over time, he continuously became more and more powerful, but was eventually arrested and beheaded for taking advantage of the king. But yeah, this is evident that uh, in the 1700s, nobility spoke far more German, and uh, this was more so the case in that period. But there's obviously an overlap into the 19th century. Another thing I just recently learned about this period, though, the late 1700s, was that uh, Danish wasn't even the official language of military orders until the very late 1770s. So again, by the mid-19th century, there was probably still a common understanding that Danish wasn't the most prestigious language. Jerry Wood says, I'm no expert, but I cannot imagine the British accepting Danish inclusion in the German Empire. That would have meant the Germans would have had possessions across the north of Britain, namely the Faroes, Iceland, and Greenland, as well as what is now the U.S. Virgin Islands. So, yes, that is true, and that's not something I really considered at all in my original video. Something that comes to mind, though, that, you know, the question I'm asking is how strategically important were these territories? I mean, were they even a net benefit to the Kingdom of, Den of Denmark, or were they just a drain? The Faroes and Iceland really didn't change ownership very much at all throughout history. 
by the mid-19th century, they were pretty used to Danish control. And then Denmark had control over the Virgin Islands since the 1600s. Um, I, I don't see a German Virgin Islands to be too controversial, but yeah, the question of a German Greenland, Iceland, and Faroe Islands is interesting. With the fall of Denmark, I could easily see Britain making a deal with Bismarck to snatch up at least some of the North Atlantic territories. This is truly something I need to look further into. Something I am thinking of, though, is that in 1815, the Congress of Vienna allowed Denmark to keep all of these territories. And that, that's probably because they weren't considered very important, you know, either economically or strategically. But of course, that was 1815, so maybe by the mid-19th century, they could have served a different strategic purpose. Per Axel Peterson says, As a Dane with some interest in history, I would like to say that your story is both interesting and pretty close to reality. And certainly Denmark might, with the blessing of her king, have been integrated into Germany and a little later the Reich. However, you make a small but significant error. King Christian IX did not want the new constitution. He was more or less forced to sign it by the government. This led to war, defeat, and strangely, also the preservation of the kingdom in its present mononational form. It looks like you're right. This is also something I didn't consider too much. A few other people brought up this point as well. Lars Monk says Christian IX himself was against the November Constitution, but as a constitutional monarch, he was obliged to sign it. When both chambers of the parliament had voted for it, the National Liberal Party was responsible for this. So I, I knew about the pressure for Christian IX to sign, but I did not know about the parliament voting for it as well. And that's probably something that deserves a lot more attention, the politics around these key decisions. I almost portrayed the monarchs as if they had absolutist power, but in reality, a constitutional monarchy was started with the death of Christian VIII and the start of Frederick VII's rule. So, Peter Morganson says, The background story for this is really not complete without going back to Danish King Abel and the history behind the Danish borderland of Schleswig and the German county of Holstein. In general, the power struggle of individual noblemen around the position of duke and marriages of Schleswig ended up with some rather inflexible treaties demanding that Schleswig and Holstein would never be separated, leading to a border based on culture, somewhat like the contemporary, not being possible. I did not know much about this. I did some further research, and it is pretty important. Uh, it's just my video wasn't really about the about this period. But if you are curious, it looks like in the mid-1000s and 1100s, the Duchy of Schleswig was created as an appanage title. So that means that the king would make a younger brother a duke of this land, but of course it was still part of the kingdom. What Peter mentioned though is that certain rivalries, notably with Abel, the Duke of Schleswig, and his older brother, the King of Denmark, Eric IV, would occur and that occasionally the Duke of Schleswig would attempt to gain more power and sometimes become an independent entity. It also doesn't help that the Dukes of Schleswig would often make connections with their neighbor, with their neighboring Holstein, which was a fief of the Holy Roman Empire. These are the factors which, over time, place Schleswig in the complicated legal position that it's in right before the outbreak of the Schleswig Wars. Thomas Sorensen says, Prussia's enemies and rivals, the UK and France in particular, would never have allowed Prussia to take Denmark because of its strategic geographical position between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. Bismarck knew this. Uh, first of all, I, I don't think Britain was really an enemy of Prussia or Germany in the 19th century. They simply would prefer Denmark's continued existence because they thought it would be easier to control trade with and in the Baltic. Then keep in mind as well that Britain, France, and even Russia, they all signed the London Protocol, and it was accepted by all of them that the November Constitution broke the agreement. Uh, Britain and Russia had a lot of interest in preserving Denmark for their influence over Baltic trade, but it would be hypocritical for any of the great powers to interfere with the German Confederation's war with Denmark. I mean, we also need to keep in mind that uh, with the alliance system, relationships countries had with each other changed somewhat frequently in the 19th century. 
so who knows what could have happened. But I think my point still mostly stands. Jim Harper says, There was a huge percentage of Danes who left and moved to the central U.S. Much of the German immigration into Nebraska was from Schleswig-Holstein. The rest was from the other low German states. I have often wondered about the cultural drivers that pushed all these people into Nebraska and western Iowa. Now, that is very interesting, and that's another thing I need to look further into. I do know that German immigration in general to the United States and Canada spiked with all the wars of German unification, but I did not know about this notable uh, presence of Germans from Schleswig-Holstein and Danes from this area as well. Nunu says, The loss of southern Jutland, the most significant event in Scandinavia during the 19th century? Sweden literally lost half of its territory to Russia in 1809. That's quite a bit more than what Denmark lost in 1864. That's true. Uh, There was a lot of shifting of political borders, boundaries in Scandinavia in the 19th century. And I just want to note that I said um, that the loss of the duchies was perhaps the most significant event in 19th century Scandinavia. But uh, I agree, a lot of this has to do with opinion. Yeah, also keep in mind that Denmark lost the entirety of Norway after the Congress of Vienna in 1815 because the Concert of Europe decided to compensate for Sweden's loss of Norway. Also keep in mind that Denmark lost the entirety of Norway after the Congress of Vienna in 1815. So many people would say that this was the most significant event in 19th century Scandinavia. And this was, of course, done to compensate for Sweden's loss uh, because um, Norway was taken away from Denmark and given to Sweden. Denmark was punished for its participation on the losing side of the Napoleonic Wars, so the loss of Norway perhaps wasn't as big of a deal because at that time they were only around 1 million in number. The population of the territory Denmark lost after the defeat of the Schleswig Wars was the exact same, uh, if not a little more, than Norway. Again, about 1 million. The duchies also possessed many ethnic Danes that were separated from their home kingdom and A vast amount of their industry and agriculture was lost as well. And then with Sweden, when when they lost Finland, it only lost about 800,000 people and was rewarded with Norway, which had a larger population, again about 1 million, and was about the same size. So maybe Sweden really got a good deal out of this rearranging of borders in the Congress of Vienna. Overall, I'm not trying to close the debate as to what was the most devastating moment in uh, 19th century Scandinavia, but I think it's fair to say that the loss of the duchies was at least one of the biggest changes or devastations. Christian Kastorf says, You are right in that comparison to the situation in Austria-Hungary. The Danish Stamstaten, or Gesamstadt, as we say in German, had the same problems the Austrians had, and the revolt against Danish rule from March 1848 till 1850-51 had the same reasons as the revolt of the Hungarians and Italians against Habsburg rule, independence and political liberty. Absolutely, I don't have too much to say about this one either because I pretty much agree. A lot of what happened during the period of the Schleswig Wars is very similar to other conflicts in Europe at the exact same time. And what 19th century historians often do is make these big, broad statements about what was going on in Europe in a particular time. So often you'll hear about the revolutions of 1848, in which the first Schleswig War is one of them, but that also includes uprisings in the Italian states and France, all throughout Germany, and of course Austria, Hungary, but also Spain, Ireland, Belgium, pretty much any European state you can think of, with maybe the exceptions of 
uh, Russia and Britain, but even that is arguable. On to the next comment. Auxiliar Corpset says, This is one of the best short explanations of the whole Schleswig question I ever heard. Good job. One thing I am not sure if you mentioned. The 1863 Constitution also threw out Lauenburg and Holstein of the whole state. Since this would have removed any argument for German meddling in what was seen as internal Danish affairs. Thank you, and yes, that makes a lot of sense. Christian IX would definitely want to treat Schleswig differently than the other duchies, Holstein and Lauenburg, which were actually part of the German Confederation. And again, a lot of this is just a reminder, but it's always nice to clarify some things. It looks as though incorporating those territories into the whole state would be nearly impossible at this point. Although at the same time, I imagine the Danish monarchs had little incentive to, uh, say, forfeit the duchies, they just may not be so surprised or disappointed if they eventually stop being the dukes of these territories. All right, and now for the final comment I have selected for today. Tobias Ryman says, Great informative video. Also, by the time of 1864, the Danish monarch did no longer have the power to actually do this. Also a reason it was re rejected by Bismarck, as in 1849 the Danish constitution was made. And you are 100% correct that have this been done, however unlikely, it would have led to open revolt and possible revolution and the end of the Danish monarchy. Danish nationalism and anti-German sentiment was very high in the northern parts of the kingdom. It's quite interesting to see the weird dynamic with Danish-German relations in the 1800s to 1900s. I personally remember how my grandparents absolutely despised Germans and called them actually subhuman, mainly because of the invasion of Denmark during World War II. While my parents did not care much for Germans in general, then there was my generation, where Germans in Germany is again viewed in a positive light. My grandfather was angry that Schleswig was not given back to Denmark after World War II, while someone like me never even considered that to be Danish at all. Thank you, Tobias. That's really interesting. Um, it sort of reminds me of how, hopefully this isn't off-putting, but it sort of reminds me of how oftentimes a third-generation immigrant will start to lose some of the culture. And so you see, like, uh, people born in Denmark right now, they don't have any problems with Germans, at least not um, at least not ones that originate from World War II, or let alone the uh, Schleswig Wars. But I imagine something very similar happened with uh, Americans and the British after the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, uh, but it's just been so long that we have lost that hateful sentiment of each other. But uh, anyway, it's always so interesting for me to hear about the modern repercussions of some of this history. So that's about all I have for today. I'm sorry if I wasn't able to get to your comment. There were a lot of them, but hopefully this was a good sample size. I hope you enjoyed, and please let me know what you thought of this video. I feel like videos like this allow me to connect to my audience a bit better, and it's far easier to produce than scripted ones. But on the other hand, it's all just conjecture coming from me. Uh, and conjecture isn't always a bad thing, but maybe there's just little interest in it. Anyway, let me know what you think, and have a great day.